we doing all right this morning? Hey, it is good to be with you once again. A special welcome to those of you joining us for the very first time or for the first time in a long while. Welcome to Rocky Peak this weekend. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Dre. I'm one of the teaching pastors, and I'm going to lead us in that time of teaching. But before we do, I've got one more announcement to go ahead and highlight for us before we start. And that's that we are in the midst of our annual Give Water Generosity Initiative here as a church. And if you're new to Rocky Peak, every year around this time, what we do is we turn our focus focus to the area, turn our focus to Africa, and in particular, raising funds to be able to dig water wells to provide fresh water for communities that don't have access to it. And we've been doing this for the last several years, and we got to celebrate last weekend during Easter that because of your generosity as a church, we've been able to dig over 120 water wells for communities in Africa. And not only does that provide a very practical need, but I just love the imagery of how that allows us to to be able to provide the gospel by talking about Jesus being the true living water that our souls need. And this year, we're approaching it a little bit different than years past, in which years past, we focused on one specific week and talked about doing a beverage fast. And for those of you familiar, if the Lord's leading you, you're welcome to do it. But this year, we're going to be focused on raising as much money as we can to provide as much water as we can. And so the beverage fast, being able to donate is open now through the end of the month. And so if you're feeling the Lord stirring you to be a part of this, there in the back of your program, there's more information as well as where to go on our website to be able to donate to that. And I hope again that you would seek the Lord in this because what a simple yet awesome way to be able to be the hands and feet of Jesus, right? All right, as we're gonna go into our time of teaching, if you haven't done so already, pull out your green and white message note sheet. It's a great tool to follow along. It's a great opportunity to write down anything in the white space that the Holy Spirit is prompting you to remember. I'm ready to give you everything I got. You ready, nine o'clock? Let's pray. Jesus, the tomb is empty. I don't wanna become numb to that truth. The tomb is empty empty. That means you have risen as the conquering king. That means you have conquered death. You have conquered sin. You have conquered darkness. You have invaded our lives with life and life to the full with hope, Jesus. And there's many of us here that as we walked in, we walked in as a people without hope. And you are the king that gives it freely. And so Jesus, here we are a week removed from Easter, but what we celebrated doesn't end just because the calendar moves on. We continue to celebrate because our King is alive and our King lives in us. And so as we've gathered together this morning as your people, King Jesus, as we open up your word, which continues to be a source of life, the Bible itself describes it as living and active. We are not gonna say speak because you already are. Instead, we're gonna say we are committed to listening to what our King has to say. And finally, Jesus, as I often pray, I pray as a communicator that I would become much, much less. What's about to take place has nothing to do with me. And I pray that you, King Jesus, the Christ, the Lord, become much, much more in our eyes and in our hearts. And it's in your key name, King Jesus, we all said, amen. You know, in the last month, I was reading this book that introduced me to a minor Jewish holiday that I'd never heard of before called Rosh Hodesh. And this is a holiday that commemorates the beginning of a new month in the Jewish calendar. And as I was reading, what I was learning is that the Jewish calendar follows the cycles of the moon. And for a long, long time, the Jewish cal- for a long, long time now, the Jewish calendar, as well as most modern calendars, are determined mathematically to be able to determine when the months begin and end. But what I was learning is that before they made that transition, if we look at ancient Judaism, so just to orient ourselves, let's think about the latter half of the Old Testament. How they would determine that a new month had started was that they would literally just look up into the sky. And when the new moon was spotted, the new moon indicating that a new lunar cycle had begun, they would send word to Jerusalem 
And then in Jerusalem, the religious leaders would confirm that, yes, this is the first sighting of the new moon. That means a new month had begun. And so when they confirmed it, something like a shofar would sound. There would be a celebration. And then there would be men whose job was to go up to a nearby mountaintop with large poles of cedar that usually had something tied to the end of it. Think of leaves or other pieces of wood. They would light it on fire and they would wave it at the mountaintop as a beacon to signal other mountains and they would wait until they would see the next beacons lit and then the next and then the next and for those of you that understand the Lord of the Rings reference this is like lighting the beacons at Gondor to summon the men of Rohan to come to war right And the reason why these beacons mattered is, again, as I kind of place ourselves in the latter half of the Old Testament, the Jewish people were living in a period called the Diaspora, meaning they had, many of them had been scattered from their homeland. And so wherever it was that they were, when they would see this beacon, they would know that a new month had started, which again, wherever you were, that kept you in sync with Jerusalem to be able to celebrate the high holy days. But not only that, This celebration also carried with it deep themes of resilience as well as renewal. Because at this time in history, they were living through a time of suffering. They were living through a time of unknown circumstances. And when they would see those beacons, they knew that a new day, a new month had begun. And there's something about a new beginning that regardless of our circumstances just brings hope, doesn't it? And the reason why I start with this example is I want to take that metaphor of a beacon that a new day has come, and I want to apply that to what we just celebrated just one week ago, and that's Easter, the resurrection of King Jesus, because what I want to propose to us this morning is that the empty tomb is the beacon that the ultimate new has come. And so there in the front of your note sheet, I want to take you to a passage in Acts, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And so again, just a little bit of context, this is the resurrected Jesus speaking to his followers right before he ascends back to the right hand of the Father. And this is what Jesus says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And this verse is incredibly meaningful to me. One, it is full of wonderful teaching that one day I would love to do a deep dive. We could do a whole multi-week series just on this verse. But to take a 30,000 foot view of what Jesus is saying is the resurrected Jesus is telling his followers then as well as his followers today, us, that we are no longer doing life as we did. It is no longer business as usual. In this verse, he's saying this life to come is now gonna be defined by the presence of God. It's gonna be defined by the power of God. It's gonna be defined by a new purpose. It's gonna be defined by a new partnership in other other words, what Jesus is establishing, that as we live on the other side of his resurrection, on the other side of Easter, the empty tomb is a beacon that a whole new existence has come into play. Not simply a new day, a new month, or a new year, but the resurrection of Jesus is a beacon that a whole new existence has come. And that's what we're gonna be unpacking together over these next few weeks. And so I'm excited that you're here. We're kicking off a new series called The New Reality. And the premise is beautifully simple, that the resurrection of Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promises from the early days of Genesis to send a savior to us. But the resurrection of Jesus is also the beginning of what we're calling it a brand new reality. And so hear me, church, we don't move on from Easter. We live our lives in the truth of Easter. We live our lives in the, in, the, in the truth that the resurrection has now changed everything. And over the next three weeks, we're gonna be looking at three key distinctives of this new reality. And in our time together this morning, we're gonna be looking at the first distinctive, and that's that the resurrection of Jesus transforms us from the inside out. In other words, the resurrection of Jesus creates a new you. 
And so together we're gonna be unpacking that this morning that as part of being a new reality, it requires a new type of person to inhabit it. That's what transformation is all about. And so let's dig into that together. There in your note sheet, you've got a section titled A Whole New World, as my friends Aladdin and Jasmine would say. If you got your Bibles, open them up. You got your apps, turn them on. We're gonna be going to 2 Corinthians chapter five. Second Corinthians chapter five, we're gonna be starting at verse 16, but before we do, I need to give us a little bit of context. And again, remember the beauty of context. It's not simply to gain intellectual facts, but context helps us understand what is actually going on at the time this was written so that our hearts can build an emotional connection to the words of scripture. And so Paul, the apostle Paul, is this is his second letter in the New Testament to the church at Corinth. The ancient city of Corinth was located in Southern Greece. And we need to understand the situation that Paul is addressing throughout his letters. See, the church at Corinth had a spectacular start. When they began, Paul helped plant this church. When they began giving their lives to Jesus, they were experiencing significant transformation. And from what we understand in Paul's writing, that transformation also came with a significant outpouring of the Holy Spirit and these miraculous gifts that were being exercised. But as we begin to read Paul's first letter, 1 Corinthians, the church had lost its way and they were now a church in a significant crisis. In fact, in the very first chapter of of the letter of 1 Corinthians, we see that this church was incredibly divided and at war with one another. And so 2 Corinthians is written about a year after the first letter. And so not only has the church not, has the church not let, gotten out of this crisis they were in, but now there are some in the church that are significantly challenging the apostle Paul. They're challenging his right to be a leader. They're challenging, why are you an apostle to begin with? And we're gonna get into the why as we go into it, but I need to set the stage for what Paul is saying. So as we start in verse 16, So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. If you have the ability to underline or highlight, would you underline or highlight that phrase, worldly point of view? So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. And let's stop and unpack because there is actually a lot in that one verse. And one thing that helps us understand the Bible well is to begin to ask the question we need to or to ask, we need to define the terms that are used. And so Paul is using a term called worldly. If you have some older translations, it might say from from the flesh. And so really what Paul is saying that as Christ followers, we no longer live by the values, the rules, or the priorities of the world around us. To be worldly is that we are living our lives based on the values, on the rules, or the priorities of the world around us. And so what Paul is calling out to the church at Corinth, but what Paul is calling out to our hearts today is that a Christ follower that is living from a worldly point of view is one who with their mouth proclaims the gospel of Jesus, but whose life looks no different than the people around us, whose lives fit in very easily to the culture that we're living in. And the reason why Paul is addressing this is earlier in this chapter, he's defending himself and his apostleship. One of the biggest issues they had was based on a cultural standard, Paul did not look like a winner. Paul did not look like a good leader because Paul suffered a lot. Because Paul, they had, when it came to being a good leader, the church of Corinth had adopted this American idol type mentality that a good leader is better than the common folk and they like to lord that over them. They like to prove them. They like to show that they are winners. And Paul was anything but that. Paul intentionally held back on using the miraculous gifts because he didn't want it to be misconstrued. Paul would give away his preaching for free while the good preachers would charge people for the privilege to hear them. 
good preachers in the church had letters of recommendations from their peers going, man, this person is spectacular. This person is better than the average human. And Paul didn't have anything like that. And so what is Paul calling out? He's calling out a common temptation that we all face in our day-to-day lives. Christ follower, you're thinking like you used to before Jesus. You're thinking like you used to before Jesus. And that's only gonna lead us to destruction because ultimately, what does he say? That old way of thinking is not what revealed who Jesus is in your life. That old way of thinking, what it's gonna accomplish, it's gonna lead you to forget who Jesus really is. And again, Paul is challenging in love. He's saying, hey, the old way of thinking was convinced they knew everything there was about Jesus. This is personal to Paul. Remember, he was a persecutor of the church. He felt that Jesus and the church, the early church were a threat to his people, a threat to his nation, a threat to his religion. He thought he knew. And he was saying, all the old way did was blind me to the truth of where life is found. And he's reminding us, Christ follower, don't go back. And before I move on, I just want to make a quick sidebar here. Man, the church at Corinth often made life hard for Paul. And what I find extraordinary is filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul doesn't quit on them. Paul does not quit on his family. And even though he has to speak harshly at times, he doesn't quit on this church. His desire is to see them thrive. And that's by knowing the truth of what the resurrection means. And so as we go on, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. Would you underline or highlight the entirety of that verse? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Now, there is a lot of key clarity that this verse brings to what it means that we are now living in the aftermath of the resurrection of Jesus. In other words, what it means that we are living in a new reality. And I wanna unpack that further, but before we do, I need to invite us to kind of do an exercise in humility. See, a lot of us that have been around church for any length of time, we've often heard the word new in church. We've often heard the word new attached to beautiful truths that we are new people, that Christ has done a new work in our heart, that Christ has come to bring us new. In fact, it's the title of this series. It's the title of this message, a new reality, a new you. There are many of us that we have heard the word new associated with the Christian life over and over and over again, that truthfully we have become numb to what it means. The word has lost its meaning and it's almost become distorted. And so the exercise in humility is we need to take an example from the movie, The Prince's Bride. Do you remember in the movie, The Prince's Bride, Vizzini, the shorter gentleman, he keeps getting thwarted. And what does he say each time he's thwarted? Oh, don't be shy. What does he say? Inconceivable. He can't believe that Wesley keeps moving forward. He goes, inconceivable, inconceivable. And then finally, what does Inigo Montoya say to him? You keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. (laughs) And I need to start with my heart and I'm inviting you to come and join me that I think at some level, we think we get what it means that Jesus has made us anew. But the beautiful truth is I think we're only scratching the surface. And so as we dig into what Paul means, are we approaching it with an open heart? Holy Spirit, show me more than what I see on the surface. Show me what it means to be new. There is a beautiful depth to this. And there on your note sheet, to help us unpack this, I have a statement that I've broken into two parts. So let's do the first part. The first fill-in is this. The resurrection of Jesus is a wrecking ball to our old life. Let 
the resurrection of Jesus is a wrecking ball to our old life. And understand the implication of this statement. Understand why I use that image. Because a wrecking ball isn't subtle, is it? A wrecking ball has one purpose, and that's to level everything in its path so that something new can be built on top of it. The point of a wrecking ball, again, is to level everything in its path so something new can be built on it. And that's the purpose of the resurrection of Jesus. See, we've already been formed. Our hearts have been formed. We have been formed by our families of origin. We have been formed by the world around us. We have been formed by our hopes and dreams. We have been formed by our failures, our hurts, our suffering. We have been formed. And the resurrection of Jesus means to demolish everything of the world that has formed our hearts so that God can then build something new. But we need to see the resurrection for what it is. It's not a polite kind, excuse me, could you fit me into your schedule? The resurrection is meant to be a wrecking ball to demolish everything so that God can then build new. And as I say that, I'm sure that a lot of us are feeling a mix of different things. One, there's a sense of excitement to go, man, yes, I want God to build something new. I want God to reclaim this area of my heart. I want God to take my whole heart. That is exciting. And yet at the same time, it's terrifying, right? Because what does it mean to experience the new? It's something we don't know. And I don't know about you, but I'm not comfortable with what I don't know. And when I think of the way that my heart has been formed, my heart has been formed by what I've known, what I've known my whole life or what I've known my whole adult life. My heart has been formed by what makes sense to me, what makes sense to our culture. My heart has been formed by what everyone else is doing. And so in a way, it's a little unsettling because when I think about my own life and I think about my own actions, all of a sudden the church at Corinth becomes a lot more relatable because they're not filled with these terrible melodrama villains. They're filled with normal people just like me that when push comes to shove, their heart automatically goes back to what it knew. Let me give you a couple of examples of what this looks like. So many of us are dealing with the temptation in the day and age we live with that if we feel hurt, if we feel angered, if we feel like people need to be put in their place, what do we do? We turn to social media. What do we do? We turn to social media and post things, vicious things, hateful things, and we think we're doing a good thing, right? And why do we find ourselves doing that? Because in a lot of cases, it's what we've known. In a lot of cases, it's what makes sense, In a lot of cases, it's because that's how everyone else is doing it. And so we're going to fight fire with fire. Let me use another example when it comes to conflict. And this is a personal one. I'm speaking of myself here right now. That often when I find myself in conflict, when I find myself challenged, when I don't like what's being said to me, when I find myself hurt, I don't respond in an explosive, angry matter. Instead, what I do is I withdraw. And said, what I do is I start separating myself, whether it's from family or friend or even church community. What I find myself doing is I'd rather separate myself. I would rather not deal with it. I would rather not have clarifying or healing conversations. I would rather just ignore it, but be passive and bitter and growing in my heart. And why do I do that? Because it's what I've known. Because in a way, it makes sense to me. And because of the community around me, it's what I see other people doing. And so again, we understand that this tug of ours, Michael has often said that as Christ followers, we live in the new, but on this side of heaven, we still have a tug to the dark side of sin. The sin is still tugging us back to the old ways of thinking. And Paul is reminding Corinth as well as reminding us, no, 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 no. The old way is incompatible with the resurrection of Jesus. The old ways are are meant to be destroyed by the wrecking ball that is new life. There in your note sheet, there's a quote by James Denny. James Denny was a Scottish theologian in the late 1800s, early 1900s. 
And talking about this passage, this is what he has to say. The past was dead to Paul, as dead as Christ on his cross. And so again, dead. All its ideas, all its hopes, all its ambitions were dead in Christ. He, referring to Paul, was another man in another universe. And the idea of the past being dead, the wrecking ball, that can feel incredibly intimidating. But think about the last statement he made. You, Christ follower, are a new man or a new woman in a brand new universe. Which leads me to the second part of that statement, the next villain, and the beginning of a radically new one. The resurrection of Jesus is a wrecking ball to our old life and the beginning of of a radically new one. And if you would humor me, would you circle the word radically? For those of you that have heard me teach, I come back to the statement a lot, but hear the word, hear the vision of the Apostle Paul that the resurrection of Jesus is not meant to make us slightly better versions of who we used to be. The resurrection of Jesus is not meant to make a version of Dre that's 10% improved. Maybe I curse a little bit less. Maybe I try to get to church more on time every so often. Maybe I try to give a little bit of money and I show up to my life group four out of 10 times. The church of, the resurrection of Jesus is meant to make a radically new creation out of each and every one of us. And in fact, to show this, let's keep reading. Let's go back to, let's go to verse 18. All this, so the new reality, is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Would you underline or highlight that? Who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Verse 20, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. That's another way of saying witnesses, that word we looked at at Acts 1.8. Therefore, we are Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That word reconciled comes up over and over again in this passage and understand what Paul is teaching us about the new reality because of the resurrection, that to be reconciled means that the death and resurrection of Jesus means we are now restored to relationship with God the Father. Our story used to be one of separation. Our story used to be one of being separated from God. It used to be a story defined by sin, a story defined by death, but Paul is reminding all of us that because of the resurrection of Jesus, you have now been reconciled. You have now been restored to relationship with God the Father. That is now the place you live. You now live in restored relationship. And another message for another time, but we not only live in that, but now our purpose is to go and share that with a world that doesn't yet know it. You now live in restored relationship. And as we look at verse 21, the final verse for our time, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him, catch this, we might become the righteousness of God. Would you underline or highlight that? So that in him, in other words, in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. That is God's vision for your life. God's vision is that your whole life. Notice it doesn't say that in Christ, some of you, would become the righteousness of God. Most of you would become the righteousness of God. The good parts of you, the talented parts of you, the successful parts of you, the parts that everybody seems to like would become the righteousness of God. This is encompassing our whole 
identity, that all of you, God's vision through the work of Jesus is that you as a whole being would become the righteousness of God. We are living in a radically new world now, aren't we? And ultimately, if I sum up, what is the key thing that Paul is teaching us about this new world there in your note sheet? is what I call the foundation, and your fill-in is this. The key distinctive of this new world is, is these two words, with God. With God. With God. I mentioned already, our story was one of separation. Our story was one of separation from God because of our sins. A holy God could not be in the presence of a defiled people. And yet Jesus came and took our place. Jesus took upon the sins of the world. Just as Jesus was nailed to that cross, our sins were nailed to that cross. And because Jesus conquered it, because he crucified our sins, because Jesus lives, now we get to live with God. And hear me, sometimes we put a undue limitation to what that phrase means. Sometimes we expect to encounter God in certain places and not other. But remember, Paul is talking about a whole life architecture here, is he not? And so what we get to live in the distinctive of this new world is that we now live with God with no exception. We live with God in every moment, in every season, in every circumstance. We have now a people that get to live with God through it all. And so hear me, when you are experiencing your good days, the metaphoric sun is shining, you are having fun, you are experiencing, you are experiencing success, you are now doing so with God. When you are going through your storms, when you're going through your heartbreak, when you're going through your seasons of doubt, your seasons of numb, your seasons of deconstruction, you are now doing that with God. When you are living in your everyday routine, the seemingly mundane, the boring, the laundry, the car pickup lines, the dishwashing, we are now doing that with God. There seems to be a, a, a temptation in our hearts at times to separate out that God clearly doesn't mean everything, right? God has got better things to do. God is going to be there at church. He's going to be there at my life group. He's going to be there at the encounter, but he's not going to be there when I'm doing dishes. He doesn't feel like he's there in my misery. He doesn't feel like he's there in the heartbreak. And Paul is reminding us, Christ follower, this is the mark of your new life. All of it is done with God, with God, with God. And it's interesting because I was a Christ follower from the time I was 15 years old, but it wasn't until I was a young adult that God really taught me this, and it was in an unexpected way. So let me take you back to the year 2006. This is 18 years ago. And so Megan and I are newly married. We're living in Northridge. And one morning, I'm shopping at Target. I'm at the Target on Baboa and Nerdoff. And like I tend to do, I was by myself. I had my headphones connected to my iPod, because it is 2006. And it's on shuffle, and as I'm walking around this worship song, which is now an older worship song called From the Inside Out came on. And the song is by a group called Hillsong United, and it's fantastic. If you listen to it for the first time, it sounds like an 18-year-old song, but it's wonderful. And this is a song that still to this day is very meaningful to me. It's a song that God has used in powerful ways. And up to that point, I had had very powerful experiences with that song, but I had had powerful experiences in the places I would have expected to have powerful experiences. At church, in worship services, in a camp or retreat experience. And so here I am walking through Target, and as the song is playing, I'm feeling something stirring that at the time, I didn't have the words to describe, but looking back, I can only say it was the Holy Spirit opening my eyes. And I was not aware of what my body was doing, but before I knew it, I was standing in front of the tide 
out loud saying the words of the song and I had a hand outstretched out in the posture of worship in the middle of Target. And I was shocked because immediately I became aware of not just what I was doing, but I became aware of the fact I'm not at church. And I realized, or rather the Holy Spirit taught me that with God means everywhere. That song itself was just a tool. The teaching is that God is with me everywhere. And from that moment, the Holy Spirit has continually opened my eyes and I have continually encountered the truth of with God in areas in my life where I would not have expected it before. I've experienced the with God like many of you have in the hospitals. I've experienced the with God in the gravesites. I've experienced the with God in the misery and the heartbreak of dealing with a chronic illness. I've experienced the with God in my lifelong struggle with anxiety. I've experienced the with God in my exhaustion. I've experienced the beauty of the with God in my failure as my sin has hurt the people that I love most. With God in every area. There in your note sheet, John Mark Homer, somebody I've come to really adore over the last couple of years, Longtime pastor in the Portland, Oregon area, now moved out here to the San Fernando Valley recently. And he writes this, apprenticeship to Jesus. See, let me stop right there. When we give our lives to Jesus, we are restored sons and daughters. And the Bible uses the word, we now become disciples. A disciple is a student, is an apprentice. A disciple is not reserved for this upper echelon of super Christ Christians. Do you love Jesus? Boom, you're a disciple. Apprenticeship to Jesus, that is following Jesus, is a whole life process. Would you circle that? Is a whole life process. Every area of being with Jesus for the purpose of becoming like him and carrying out his work in the world. What I love about that quote is the progression of being with Jesus. And then we experience his transformation and through that get to do what he does in our world. But I don't want to go move away too quickly from the fact is a whole life process. What it means to be an apprentice of Jesus is that we are learning to give every area to him. And now that I am living in this new reality, what does it mean to approach, to do, dot, dot, dots as a new creation? And so I want to unpack this a little bit more with the time we have left. There on your note sheet, you've got a section titled A New Blueprint. And I really find for myself that visual helpful because a blueprint helps us know what it is we're supposed to be building, right? Right? But the wrong blueprint builds the wrong things. The wrong blueprint builds the wrong things. And so what we need as Christ followers is we need a new blueprint. And there in your note sheet, I put an excerpt from Colossians chapter three, which I actually think is a wonderful blueprint for what it means to live this new life, this life that's built on the resurrection. So Colossians chapter three, verse one says this, since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Verse two, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Verse four, when Christ, who is your life? Would you pause and just let the impact of that hit you? When Christ Who is your life? When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. There's a lot of beauty in that verse. And first and foremost, I noticed as I was preparing this message that over the last several times I've preached unintentionally, the Lord has brought me to share that message with you share these verses with you. And so I think there's something he's trying to tell us as a church through this. But what I want to highlight is two key things. First of all, when it comes to this being our blueprint, it means one, what does it say? Set your minds, set your hearts. 
What is that implying? That when it comes to our growth, we have a responsibility. There's action for us to take through the work, through Jesus, God has and God continues to do his part. But we need to understand that moving forward, that experiencing more of this growth, rooting ourselves deeper in maturity requires a responsibility and intentionality on our part. But the second thing, did you catch that twice? He comes back to your new identity. When Christ, who is your life? When Christ, who is your life? And so the second part of this blueprint is that we are being intentional to root ourselves, to anchor ourselves in who we now are. Christ follower. We bear his name. We bear his resurrection in our life. And so with this being a blueprint coming out of it, I just want to give us two practical encouragements and steps to understand as we move forward in, in, in God teaching us what it means to be a new you. And so the first one is this. This new life is learned. This new life is learned both as a whole, but also in each individual area, we don't naturally know how to do life with God. And for some of you, I hope this is a freeing truth and a freeing experience because a lot of us have experienced Jesus. We've, at, we've brought or surrendered ourselves to Jesus. We've given Jesus our life. And for a lot of us, when we've done that, a switch has not flipped that magically means that suddenly we know how to do it all and we know how to do it well. We just finished a 10-week series on hearing God because that is something we learn how to do. A switch didn't just flip and go, man, I can hear God with no obstructions, no problems, great. The Bible teaches over and over again, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And for many of us, we don't experience the switch getting flipped even though we wish that's how it worked, where all of a sudden we go, I'm not scared anymore. I'm not scared for my kids. I'm not scared for my life. I'm not scared for our culture. I'm good. When we read the words of Jesus, when he commands us, and please hear me with that word, commands us as Christ followers to love our enemies and pray for those that persecute us. A switch doesn't just flip and all of a sudden, especially in a heated political season, we go, boom, I know how to love my enemies. I know how to pray for those that stand against me. I'm not offended. When we read In the letter of James chapter one, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. For many of us, a switch doesn't just go on and go, boom, I don't feel the need to yell. I don't feel the need to be explosive. I don't feel the need to call this person an idiot. I don't feel the need to do any of that. I'm suddenly a really, really good listener. For the most part, a switch doesn't just get flipped, does it? And for a lot of us, we feel intimidated by that because we put the pressure on us and our willpower to have to figure out how to do it. Okay, the Bible says I need to be a person that's more loving, that loves my enemies. The Bible says I need to not be so afraid. The Bible says I need to hear God. The Bible says I need to be slow to anger. Okay, I gotta do this. I gotta work hard. I gotta do this. And again, we're putting the weight, we're putting the pressure, we're putting the responsibility on us. And what I wanna highlight is the fact that the resurrection of Jesus is what frees us from that weight. Because again, what's the distinctive of this reality? With God. And so what does that mean? This life is learned and God is with you to teach you how to do this, to teach you how to be this person. God is not throwing you out in the wilderness and saying, figure it out and come back to me when you've got it all taken care of. Instead, he says, you have no idea what you're doing. So let's do this together with God. And there's beauty in that, right? But for us to, we could talk a lot of practicals on what does it mean to take steps towards learning and growing in this area, but those practicals have to be built on a new foundation. And I need to ask an important, and in some cases, a dangerous question for us to really be able to live, for this to really be the blueprint of our lives, and that's this, are you teachable?
Are you teachable? Hear me. My own heart feels the weight of that question. Are you teachable? Hey, as I'm asking that, what emotions come up, if any? Where does your mind go? Do you quickly formulate an answer? Some cases it could be like, of course I'm teachable. In other cases, kind of self-defeating, no, I'm not, I'm terrible. For a lot of us, somewhere in between. But are you teachable? In fact, let's start actually asking that with specific areas. Are you teachable in the area of your finances? Are you teachable in the area of your sex life? Are you teachable in your anger? Are you teachable in your hurt? Are you teachable when it comes to your kids and what you want for them? Are you teachable dot, dot, dot? We could go on and on and on. But to really embrace what Colossians 3 is telling us, we need to first square the question of, are you teachable? Now, can I introduce the fact that this is a bit of a trick question? Lovingly, you're actually not capable of answering that. So what do we do? Well, we need to go to the Lord. We need to go to our creator, and we need to go to the one that knows us better than we know ourselves. And in a beautiful and daring act of prayer, we need to go before the Lord and say, Holy Spirit, am I teachable? Holy Spirit, am I teachable? Is there any area of my life that is not teachable? Is there any area that is resistant to what it is you want me to have? Is there any area that is putting up walls that is keeping life to the full out? Is there any area that is being dominated or defined by the old way of thinking? Holy Spirit, am I teachable? And as we continue to move and grow with the Holy Spirit, then we beautifully get to pray, then Holy Spirit, teach me how to be teachable. Teach me what, it like, what it's like to do life, to do this specific area with you. Stubbornness is an incredible wall that keeps life out. And no single generation owns stubbornness. It's a sin that captures all of our hearts from the youngest to the oldest. And how do we experience the opposite of that? Through this prayer. Holy Spirit, am I teachable? Teach me to be teachable. There on your note sheet, going back to John Mark Comer, there are no accidental saints. Would you, under, would you circle that? There are no accidental saints it will require you to reorder your entire life around following Jesus as your undisputed top priority over your job, over your money, over your reputation, over everything. Let me go ahead and stop right there. For so many of us, I feel the struggle in our hearts that we read a statement like that and go, that's a big statement. I have no idea how to do that. I have no idea if I have the strength to do that. I don't know if I have the courage to do that. And you are absolutely right. On your own, you cannot do this. But the Holy Spirit is with you to teach you how to do this. What we get to do is go, Holy Spirit, how do I reorient my life around the resurrection of Jesus? How do I begin creating new rhythms to live in this new reality as a new creation? Holy Spirit, I invite your wrecking ball into my heart because it might be painful, uncomfortable, and convicting, but I know you are gonna build something new. And so this new life is learned. And then finally, the last point, this new life is ongoing. This new life is ongoing, meaning it's a lifelong journey. And the pace of the Holy Spirit is an unhurried pace. 
The Holy Spirit is a, is the, is a master teacher, excuse me, is the master teacher and is a slow teacher. One of the areas in which I often find myself to be unteachable is in my sin of speed. Man, I move fast. I want life to move fast. I have never been, I've been called many things in my life. Patient is not one of them. And often what I find myself with that is, okay, God, I want to grow. I want to have this area come under your leadership. I want this area to surrender. Show me the one thing I need to do. What's the one sermon I need to listen to? What's the one group or book or study I need to do? Who's the one person I need to talk to? Can you just deal with this thorn and we can move on? Now the Holy Spirit moves slowly. And you know why? Because at a slow space and a pace and only at a slow space, pace, do we develop dependence on the authority of God in our life? And only at a slow pace do we deepen our trust in the resurrection of Jesus. It's moving at a slower pace that our hearts truly begin to root themselves in the truth that because Jesus lives, I get to as well. Because Jesus lives, now this area will experience new life. And that doesn't happen when we're running at the speed of life. And so as we go ahead and wrap things up, I'm going to invite the worship team to come on out. And we're going to close with a song that, if you were with us on Good Friday, we introduced this song for the first time at Good Friday. And what I love is that this song is a beautiful mix of gratitude for what Jesus has done, for the reason why this reality has come in. But it's also a song of commitment. It's a declaration where we get to say, Jesus, you gave me everything. And the only proper response is to give you my whole life, my whole heart. And so as we go into this time, let me encourage you, let this be a holy moment. Let this be a time in which you listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit in your life. Let this be a time in which an area is revealed that gets to, not has to, but gets to be brought under the resurrection of Jesus. Let this be a time of encouragement. Let this be a time of life. Let this be a time in which you are reminded that because the tomb is empty, the old is gone and you are now a new creation. Amen? Let's pray. Jesus, because of you, the old is gone. And I admit, first and foremost, that sometimes it wants to creep its way back into my heart and back into my life. And there's times in which I give in and I stumble and I fall but you are with me. You are with us, Jesus. And so as we declare the words of the song, this is more than just a song we're singing on a Sunday morning. This is a prayer that we're making from our hearts. This is a prayer that is saying, thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. And Jesus, teach us how to be committed to you. Teach us what it means to do life with you in every area. Jesus, remove me of the burden of feeling like I need to figure this out on my own. Remove me of the burden of trying to do this under my own willpower. On my own, I got nothing. But because of your spirit in me, because of the power of resurrection that lives in us, beautiful things, supernatural things, things beyond my wildest imagination are gonna happen because you are with us. Thank you, King Jesus, for all you've done and all you will continue to do. And it's in your name we all said, amen.